Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at a very volatile area of the world, and that's the Middle East, and in particular, the situation between the Israelis and Hamas, and what can be done to bring peace to that area. My guest today is an expert on this topic. Dr. Michael Cairo is a professor of political science, and he is the program director of international affairs at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky. His most recent book is titled American Presidents and Israeli Settlements Since 1967. Dr. Michael Cairo, welcome to today's Global Connections program. For having me, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. Let's jump right into it. We're going to be talking about the horrific slaughter that took place on October 7th, but let's work our way up to that. Let's talk about your book first. Uh, why did you write this book? And who were, you have so many presidents who have been involved in the Middle East since 1948. Who were two of the most effective ones and who were two maybe not quite as effective? Um, I, this book really started out of an interest in U.S.-Israeli relations and particularly looking at uh, presidents and prime ministers and their interactions. And as I was looking at uh, this issue, more and more what I discovered is that when there was a disagreement in the relationship, it often focused on settlements. But as I started to look into settlements further, I also found that no one had really written a book looking at how U.S. policy had um, uh, approached the settlement issue overall. And uh, unfortunately, what I found was that what Trump had done, essentially uh, giving a no holds barred Israel do what you want sort of approach, had been something we had been doing under the table for a long time. Uh, in essence, uh, rhetorically condemning settlements, rhetorically saying this is a bad policy, but not really doing anything about it to stop the process. Um, in terms of in terms of the presidents, even presidents like Jimmy Carter, when it came to the settlements issue, often backed down. Now we think of Carter as an effective peacemaker, but we need to remember that the peace that he made was really between Israel and Egypt. Uh, the Palestinians were left out of that peace. So it depends on how you want to look at effectiveness. Carter and the Camp David Accords were certainly an effective uh, peace process. Um, if you bring it forward, um, I would also argue that uh, George H.W. Bush was effective in the peace process, much more than we give him credit for. If you look at the Madrid peace process, what both those issues tell us and what's important for us to keep in mind today and might give us sort of a, a view or hope uh, to look at is that peace came after crisis. 1973, the October War, the Yom Kippur War, uh, the Ramadan War, all three names have been used. Um, in that war in 1973, you have coming out of it, Sadat and Begin, Egypt and Israel, willing to go toward peace. Um, after the Intifada in the late 1980s and the invasion of uh, Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and the subsequent American uh, policy uh, to evict Iraq from Kuwait. After that process, you get the Madrid peace process uh, coming out of it. And that led to the Oslo Accords. So oftentimes we could say that a crisis might spur peace diplomacy. If we, if, I hope that peace will come out of this horrific crisis because this is the greatest crisis I think Israel's experienced in particular, and probably Gaza too, to be quite honest, since it's been almost leveled because of horrific bombing. But hopefully it will come out of this, this terrible action that's going on right now in that area. Well, let me ask you, as, as you build up to the where we are today, what were some of the other events that uh, you were talking about giving the Israelis carte blanche to build settlements, which is in direct violation of international law. There are only about two or three countries in the world that support that being done. And of course, in the process, they were taking land from Palestinians to do it. But what were some of the other events? Was the invasion, we look at the invasion of Iraq in 2003. We look at a variety of other things, such as the withdrawal of the Iranian nuclear deal. Uh, President Trump pulled us out of that. 
And how much did they contribute, do you think, to where we are today? Well, I mean, it's, it, these things don't happen in a vacuum, as the UN Secretary General said. Um, and, you know, the real beginning of this, of course, is 1967. The uh, what the Israelis refer to as the Six Day War or the or the June War, in which Israel occupies the West Bank, Gaza, um, uh, the Golan Heights, and at the time the Sinai Peninsula. But that is what is negotiated um, during the Camp David Accords. Uh, these other issues that you talk about are significant as well, but they're significant in uh, different ways. They don't necessarily spur the settlement issue. But uh, you take, for example, the Iran nuclear deal. The Obama administration had obviously negotiated the Iran nuclear deal. Um, by all accounts, it was working. Now, what working means is, is dependent upon how you view the deal in part. But, uh, you know, the, the nuclear production by Iran had slowed. Uh, during that period of time, and uh, certainly opening up to Iran uh, was helping us in other areas of policy. You think, for example, Iran right now supports Hamas. They also are backers of Hezbollah in Lebanon to the north. Um, Hezbollah has, uh, by accounts, about 150,000 maybe missiles that they could target at uh, Israel if Iran wanted to really release them, unleash them in some way. You have the Houthi in Yemen, also supported by Iran. Now, it's not to say that Iran wouldn't continue supporting these groups, but certainly the Trump administration's pulling out of the deal has made this situation much more complicated. Um, third party actors in this region have not always helped the situation, the United States included. But uh, you can throw Russia into the mix. You can throw uh, Qatar into the mix. And ironically, you know, uh, Qatar has been supporting Hamas financially for quite some time. They are now playing the role of mediator, particularly as it goes uh, with the hostages and the hostage release. Um, but we've just found out recently that Netanyahu gave a nod to Qatar in supporting Hamas throughout this period of time, um, which... Uh, you know, you've got a third party, multiple third parties supporting uh, a group like Hamas. Um, and, and so these these other actions, the United States uh, pulling out of the Iranian deal gives the United States less ability to pressure Iran here. Um, the real concern for the United States and for other countries right now is to ensure that this war doesn't widen. And it won't take a lot for Iran to simply say to Hezbollah, go all out. Um, it's the reason why the United States has moved uh, aircraft carrier groups into uh, the region to try and send that message to Iran not to do this. But, but it's, it's uh, cutting those or severing that discussion, that diplomatic aspect, uh, did not help the situation in any significant way. You know, it's, it's been documented that the withdrawal of the Iranian nuclear deal was one of the biggest blunders of American foreign policy. There, were, there have been many blunders, like the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003, that type of thing. But this was one that really lit the powder keg in that area, because as bad as the Iranians are, as we perceive them, we still have to work with them and to put them at odds with us, especially since they have so much control over especially Hezbollah, that, that is just absolutely devastating. Do you think Israel could survive if Hezbollah got involved in this and started launching 150,000 oh, rockets wow. at them and started invading? They, they have trained fighters who are very good and started invading the north of, of Israel. I, I think Israel could survive, but it would be a very devastating conflict. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing in this conflict and uh, you might think there's some irony in it. Um, Hamas is surviving. The, and by that, I mean the leadership is surviving. Netanyahu is surviving, despite what you could really call a, a, a series of blunders. Uh, you know, the intelligence had a, basically the Hamas blueprint for this for a year. They, they knew something like this might happen. 
yet they seem so unprepared. It took hours to get to uh, the region to respond. Um, you know, Netanyahu is supposed to be the security guy. Um, Israel could certainly survive it. But in both of these cases, it's the civilians who are the ones who are uh, most affected by it. And you've got the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, but Israeli civilians living in fear, you know, as to what may or may not happen every day. Um, a hostage scenario, um, missiles coming in and not sure when or where those missiles might come in. So uh, it's the civilians in that crisis is the real question of who would survive. Um, Israel has a lot of firepower. Israel has a lot of backing from the United States. Um, I think the thing that is keeping Iran from unleashing any of this is the very real fear that it may spark um, an attack or any kind of uh, retaliation, I should say, by the United States against Iran directly. I think you're absolutely right, uh, uh, without a doubt. I see you have a United Nations flag behind you. And, of course, right the main, main player, obviously, the U.N. has been very critical because the U.N. in 47, I think the, the, uh, they voted to establish the two states of Palestine and Israel. And then in 48, it came, 1948, it came on a lot. They came online. And, of course, since then, we've seen that the U.N. has been involved. It's trying to broker peace in that area and also to provide humanitarian assistance through the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, and a variety of other UN agencies. And of course, it's the World Food Program and some of the others, that UNICEF, that are delivering or trying to deliver humanitarian goods on the ground. And it's hard to do in a war zone when you may be blown away at a moment's notice. But the Security Council is another part of the United Nations. And the Security Council has multiple resolutions calling for the basically the dismantling of the settlements or promoting peace in that area. And of course, we saw not long ago, the U.S. vetoed one of 15 members of the Security Council veto the call for a ceasefire in Gaza. How do you see the situation changing? I know when Israel was attacked on October 7th, it had the sympathy and empathy of the world. That mm -hmm. seems to be shifting quite dramatically. It is today. shifting dramatically, especially. Um, it, it, you know, let me take let me take both parts of your question. Let's start with the okay. UN and the Security Council. The UN Security Council has been hamstrung for quite some time on this is issue. Um, the United well, States has has condemned many um, um, resolutions and vetoed many resolutions uh, that the Security Council has put out. Uh, the one that you're referring to, uh, the Biden administration's argument was that uh, we vetoed the resolution because it didn't uh, call for or acknowledge the self-defense rights of Israel um, on October 7th or and after. Um, so, so that's that's one one issue here. In terms of uh, uh, the UN role, which I think was the, was the second thing that you, that that you had brought up, um, the UN has a role to play here, but we need to remember that humanitarian access requires also the assistance of the states involved. Uh, Egypt has been has been assisting here. Um, Israel, the longer that this war goes on, the more the tide is turning against them. In the, in the court of public opinion. Europe, especially, the public sentiment in Europe is already tipping significantly toward the Palestinians. Um, the longer this goes on, some suggest even, the more it helps Hamas. Um, you know, the more it emboldens uh, individuals to say, look what Israel's doing. Um, Israel's in a tough spot here. Uh, it's similar to the spot um, that we were in after 9-11. Uh, the tough spot is you can't defeat a concept. You can't defeat terror. A war on terror is an ongoing war that could last forever. Um, what does it mean to defeat Hamas from Israel's perspective? Um, this could very much mean that Israel occupies Gaza for an indefinite future. And if Israel's occupying Gaza for an indefinite future, it only feeds the public sentiment against Israel on the humanitarian issues. 
Um, so it, it's not an easy, um, uncomplicated decision for them uh, on this issue. It certainly isn't, as you mentioned, very difficult to combat a concept. We've seen that with the, the terrorists in many areas of the world, and it's extremely, extremely hard to do, if not impossible, in some areas. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We invite our viewers to go to our website at www globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, you have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking about the volatile situation in the Middle East. Our guest is an expert on this topic. Dr. Michael Cairo is a professor of political science at Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky. His most recent book is titled American Presidents in Israeli Settlements Since 1967. Mike, we're, we're, running, we're running against the clock as usual, as always. Let me ask you, is what would you recommend? Are there... Are there any steps that can be taken right now by the United States, by Israel, by Hamas, by the people in Gaza, by the Europeans, everybody involved to help reduce the conflict and to stop it? And really, they really, I, in my opinion, I know Benjamin Netanyahu didn't agree, but they need a two-state solution. That seems to be the push that's out there right now. But how does all that come together? Uh, that's a that's a big question. It pushed for time, but I will do my best. I will do my best, Bill. Um, is there a, a, a solution? Um, I think the problem here is is that you need to have credible leadership. Um, both sides have to believe that the other side is a credible leader that they can trust. Uh, Israel doesn't trust Hamas and doesn't trust the Palestinian leadership right now. And the Palestinians don't trust Netanyahu and, and don't trust the Israeli leadership right now. Um, no matter what the outside world thinks or wants to do, without those two parties starting that process and having a real discussion about what a, if there was a two-state solution, what that solution would look like, it's um, more than an uphill roll. In, in this. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is, is that uh, the settlement construction in the West Bank alone has made it difficult to suggest a two-state solution. I mean, that solution would look very awkward, to say the least, especially you're already separated between the West Bank and Gaza. Um, the outside world, um, the humanitarian response is particularly significant right now. Um, Qatar's role in this is really important at the moment. They are the ones who have been able to get Hamas uh, to mediate its, its policies and actions. The United States pressure on Israel has been really significant as well. And Biden bought a lot of time with a simple hug, a simple embrace of Netanyahu at the beginning of this that, that now has faded the further we've gone from this. But the United States has a problem too, and that is its domestic politics. You've got people on both sides of this issue, and even within the Democratic Party, pressuring Biden both ways and how to respond to this. So um, unfortunately, I don't think there are any easy solutions at the moment. You know, this, the situation is very intractable. There's no doubt about it. And as we look at it, we realize how difficult it is. But let me ask you, too, how could, given the makeup of the Knesset in Israel right now, which is Apparently, Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition is composed of primarily ultra-conservative, far-right parties who really want to, and many of them want to annihilate the Palestinians. But how difficult will it be with a Knesset like that? And do you think Benjamin Netanyahu is going to survive this? That is the $1 million question or more than $1 million and we, question. We'll have the answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, the... The coalition that Netanyahu forged is a coalition that is not prepared to negotiate with Hamas 
and not prepared to negotiate with Palestinians. That is one of the problems here. And that is part of what I was referring to when I said credible re leadership and trust on both sides, that both sides would, would respect as credible leadership. I think Netanyahu's in trouble. Do I think he's in trouble today? No. I mean, one of the problems is, is what's the viable alternative? You could actually end up with a worse situation in terms of the prime ministerial ship at the moment. But I do think Benjamin Netanyahu has been discredited. And I think more important than that, a couple of Israeli myths have been discredited about this conflict. Um, Netanyahu and his party and the Israelis believe they could contain Hamas in Gaza. That was part of the reasoning behind funding money from Qatar. They believed Israel was invulnerable. They believed that the Abraham Accords would somehow force Arabs to abandon Palestinians. This the Israeli action has actually caused a lot of the Arab world to move further away from Israel because they're appealing to their publics and public sentiments. Um, probably the most important thing that comes out of this is that the United States has ignored the situation. Trump basically handed the situation to Israel, but Biden hasn't really engaged in the situation until October 7th. And if the United States isn't going to engage, and that's not to say that we're the most honest broker. I mean, we clearly have a side in this. But I believe that Israeli interests are furthered when Israel is pursuing peace and working with the Palestinians rather than uh, establishing settlements and, and uh, essentially um, dictating policy in the region. Um, but it's not going to happen without true engagement. Peace takes work. Uh, you know, the Oslo Accords, which clearly have not been successful, but mainly because of leadership over the years. But when the Oslo Accords were forged, they began through back channels between Palestinians and Israelis. And without that kind of dialogue, it's not going to happen. And I don't see that dialogue happening right now with the two leaderships uh, in place. You have to have two to negotiate and they have to have some confidence in one another. Well, Mike, we're down to about our last minute. What would you like to say in closing that we can think about or maybe get involved in helping to bring peace to that very troubled area of the world because it does affect us. We think it does in many cases. What's happening over there is, what, 7,000 miles away or whatever. We don't have to worry about it, but that is not the case. But what would, what do you, what would you tell us or give us advice to do or think about? I think the most important thing we need to remember in, this, in these types of crises, and in this crisis in particular, is that there are people just like us involved in this crisis. The civilians are the ones who are facing the greatest uh, problems, the greatest challenges. The leaders that we're focusing on and we often focus on in our discussions are, are generally pretty safe. You know, Netanyahu is, is pretty protected. Hamas leaders are, are pretty protected. Um, it's the civilians that are that are hurting. And we need to remember that because I think it, it, it drives our humanitarian impulse. To, to help and provide aid for both sides in a crisis like this, for the people who really are hurting. And that's it's, a role the UN can certainly play and other NGOs that are, that are very much involved. It certainly does, and we have to move forward in that direction. But Dr. Michael Cairo, you've been involved for decades in informing us and working towards peace in that area of the world. And I want to thank you for all the work you've done in the past, and thank you very much for a very interesting and a very informative program today. Thank you, Bill. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.